Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Chris Bloom. I'm board president of the Mid City Neighborhood Organization, and welcome you to our May general meeting. Uh, we have a little bit of a light schedule this evening. So, after a few announcements and uh, one presenter, we'll go over a couple other pending issues going on in Mid City, uh, open for discussion and looking for some input for any attendees. So, please let us know. Um, Let's see, uh, Council Member Giarusso, I think may be attending late, but we're, we're definitely gonna keep a spot for open for him. Um, so let's go with our uh, pre first presenter, Mr. Cox, you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, <clears throat> can you all hear me? Yes, sir. Perfect, uh, I'm Josh Cox. Uh, I'm the, the Mayor's Director of Strategic Initiatives. I'm also uh, a good citizen myself. Well, we heard you at first, but it got a lot really quiet, really oh, <laughs> very fast. All right, maybe I uh, I should call in. I will call in. Give me one second, please. Sure. Good now. I'm going to move your computer for you. How about that? Perfect. Can you hear me now? Absolutely. All right, great. Um, my name is Josh Cox. I am uh, the Mayor's Director of Strategic Initiatives. I am also a mid citizen. I live at um, Orleans and North Lopez. So uh, it's, it's, it's really cool to be connected with you guys. Um, you know, I'm here to talk about uh, the, the new Office of Gun Violence Prevention that's been launched. I'm going to try to share my screen. Give me one second. All right. Can you guys see, see the screen? All right. Now, it'll come as no secret to, to any of you on this call that New Orleans has had over 100 murders annually every single year since 1970. Um, it is a, a problem that has taken us a generation to get into, uh, and it's definitely a problem that we're not going to see progress on overnight. Uh, when the mayor first got elected, her transition team met on this issue and recommended that a, a task force be created to basically create a plan for how the city should move forward on this issue. Um, on her first day in office, she signed an executive order creating the Gun Violence Reduction Task Force. And that task force spent a year working to craft a plan that was eventually launched in August of 2019. That plan was actually quite simple. There were three main things that were recommended. The first is that the city should be coordinating in delivering public health interventions. That means non-law enforcement interventions, but interventions that are meant to prevent um, violent behavior be before it occurs. The second is that the city needed to be active in finding alternative sor sources of funding, those interventions that I just mentioned. And finally, the city needed to get better at figuring out which interventions were working and which interventions weren't so that we could better use the limited resources that we have in order to try to combat the problem. Uh, and so 2020 happened uh, and the global pandemic is something that all of us have experienced. Violence in the city went up tremendously, but at the same time, we were working to implement that plan uh, throughout the course of the pandemic. And so about three weeks ago, uh, we launched, or the mayor launched the office, the first ever Office of Gun Violence Prevention. And it's got three core goals. The first is to deliver public health interventions, which I can talk a little bit more about in a second. The second is to find alternative forms of funding. And then the third is to study those interventions. Um, so I want to start with the first pillar, which is to deliver public health interventions. Uh, 
right now we have four public health interventions that were being stood up before we ever even launched the office. The first is uh, Cure Violence, which is a community-based uh, violence interruption program where credible messengers are sent into communities, sent into schools with the goal of trying to identify um, and intervene in conflicts to de-escalate and to mediate them before they turn violent. We've also got a hospital crisis response unit that responds um, to every shooting at UMC, which is where the overwhelming majority of shooting cases go, but also at New Orleans East Hospital as well. And when a shooting happens, we get alerted and notified. The Cure Violence Hospital team heads to um, UMC, and not only are they trying to interface with the individual who's been shot if they're conscious, but they're also trying to intervene with their family because when families come into the hospital, their emotions are so high, that is a, a perfect opportunity to try to talk family members out of, you know, potentially taking rash actions um, that, that are going to do nothing but breed, you know, constant retaliation back and forth. The second intervention that we currently have under this office is Center for Employment Opportunities. Uh, Louisiana was the incarceration capital of the world, and in 2017, Governor John Bell Edwards passed the Justice Reinvestment Act with the goal of releasing uh, folks who were incarcerated and taking those cost savings and reinvesting them into community. What this meant is that we're gonna have a lot of folks from New Orleans who were incarcerated and we're gonna be returning home. And so we as the city believe that it is our job and our goal to try to provide at least some kind of transitional employment opportunity for folks who are returning home from incarceration so that we're setting them up to have the best choices, the opportunity to make the best choices possible. And so um, we started this in November of 2019. The mayor figured out that it was possible to feed two birds with one palm of food. We took a a grass cutting contract that could have gone to the private sector. And instead of giving it to a private sector company to mow grass or to do blight abatement on certain lots in the city, we partnered with a nonprofit service provider, CEO Works, who provides transitional employment to folks coming home from incarceration. And those individuals did the exact same grass cutting, the exact same blight and lot abatement um, that we could have paid a private company to do. But instead, our own people were coming home, we're looking for a second chance, we're looking for transitional employment, they got that opportunity instead. And so we started that in uh, 2019. Since then, it's been successful. The mayor's investing another 300 grand in that program. And there's also going to be a follow-on investment in blight reduction and that program of $1 million that's going to um, happen through Wisner. So that, you know, not only are we investing in cleaning up the city, but we're investing in trying to make sure that folks can transition from incarceration back into the economy and do so um, with, some, with some dignity and, and with some economic opportunity. The third intervention that is currently under this office is the Jumpstart program. Um, if you are in any way connected to schools, you know that um, high schools have had a really hard time connecting with a lot of young people. And in a city that had a lot of young people before the pandemic that were disconnected from work and school, the gap seems like it's getting wider. And so uh, we, in conjunction with the Hilton Foundation, um, you know, received a grant to do uh, workforce development workshops for young people who are disconnected from work and school. While they do that eight week workshop, they're getting paid uh, to do it. So the idea is that we are Know, putting money in their pockets as they're training to, you know, become better employees. And then at the end of that two months, they are given a nine-month work experience that is also paid. Um, and we've already got standing relationships with employers who understand where our kids are coming from and who, you know, are invested in um, having them as employees in their, in their businesses. And so we just started this program um, on April 6th. We're in the middle of our very first cohort but we have the funding to be able to implement this program for the next two years, touching at least 100 kids um, every year. The third, or the fourth, excuse me, and final intervention that we have is the Barbers and Beautician um, Collective. Y'all might have seen a little bit of this on the news in certain places, but 
um, you know, in black communities, barbershops are central locations. I mean, everyone from the pastor to the CEO to the person who might end up, um, you know, selling drugs later that day, everybody's going to be in the barbershop. And so part of the thinking was, how do we use uh, barbers and beauticians, these community influencers, as uh, violence interrupters and as mediators, as extensions of pure violence and on some level of city hall. And so uh, they just com completed a seven week fellowship program where mediation, conflict uh, mediation was, was, was taught. Um, and, you know, young, uh, not young people, excuse me, the barbers and beauticians uh, went through several training modules around how to um, become effective violence interrupters and how to be more connected with city apparatus when it comes to delivering um, and helping folks get the services that they need. So, for instance, one of the things that I'm excited about is that, uh, you know, research suggests that that we found suggests that uh, economic opportunity and cognitive behavioral therapy are the two interventions that are most likely to uh, prevent violence or prevent a violent act uh, in someone who might be predisposed. And so one of the things we've been thinking about is how do we turn barber shops and beauty shops into places where, you know, young people can receive cognitive behavioral therapy in a setting that's culturally competent and that they will accept. And so, you know, we're going to start to try to figure out how to how to walk that path. It isn't something that, to my knowledge, has been done here in New Orleans before, but we think it can be a really um, impactful model. And we want to be trying out new ways of um, of engaging the folks who are who are at highest risk. So I just went through the four inter interventions that we have. That's pillar one. The second pillar is around studying the, the interventions that we do have. So one of the major problems is that, you know, the federal government hasn't funded gun violence research since 1996. And that's across the country. And so places like Chicago, places like Detroit, places like St. Louis, none of them have empirical data on, on what works and what doesn't. And this matters because when you have finite resources as a city, you're trying to figure out how do I spend my dollars so that I'm getting the most impact for, for the dollars that we have. And so uh, we've partnered with Tulane School of Public Health and their School of Professional Advancement to create the Gun Violence Prevention Policy Lab. And those folks are going to be measuring and evaluating our interventions over time so that, you know, 10 years from now, whenever the next mayor is here, or 20 years from now, that mayor will have far more information about which interventions are best and provide the most bang for buck um, than, than we do now. Uh, because at the end of the day, we need that information to be able to make the smartest financial decisions possible. Finally, um, if interventions that are gonna prevent violence are so critical, it's important that we have the funding necessary to scale those interventions. Government dollars, philanthropic dollars are not nearly um, enough to meet the scale of the need. A lot of this is simply poverty alleviation, poverty mitigation. And so one of the things that we've been looking into is how can we think more creatively about finding where the costs of the current system lie? So we haven't yet released this, but I mean, I, I can talk about it. It's done. Um, in 2018, we did a fiscal analysis of the cost of gun violence in this city. And it found that there were 474 shootings in 2018. And each of those shootings cost an average of $58,000 to Medicaid providers, Medicaid insurers, which is not only money that they lost, but that presents an opportunity in terms of working with those companies to prevent um, those costs from occurring uh, and also using those cost savings to reinvest um, in preventative interventions. And so, I mean, that was $25.7 million that insurance companies uh, in costs that they incurred over the average cost for a, a Medicaid recipient. So that's uh, a, a tremendous opportunity for us to start to think differently about how we pay for the interventions that we know we need. How do we pay for young folks to get jobs at scale? How do we pay for cognitive behavioral therapy at scale? Uh, and so we have been actively pursuing that, that angle. Secondly, um, the, the Biden administration has made a point of making uh, 
financial investments in gun violence mitigation and gun violence reduction. And so um, we are waiting for Treasury guidance to come out. We're also waiting for the Department of Justice to, um, to issue grants uh, around gun violence reduction, but we've already been doing the work. And so we're going to be really heavily chasing um, those federal supports so that we can continue to expand um, the work that, that we're already doing. So, you know, in closing, the strategy is three pronged. It's uh, funding, excuse me, it's uh, delivering public health interventions and programming. It's uh, working to figure out which interventions are best and having the most impact and then it's also figuring out how we scale it through funding. You know, I, I want to leave you with this. You know, I said it briefly, but this strategy is not going to be a panacea, right? We aren't going to uh, all of a sudden overcome 50 years of violence in another four or five. But what we're hoping for is that we're building the infrastructure inside government to continually get better. We hope that we're building the infrastructure inside government to be able to continually figure out how to access different forms of capital so that we can be making investments in young people before um, they wind up making choices that we as a society don't want to see. Uh, so with that, I welcome any questions. Um, and I guess I'll turn it back over to, to you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chris. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's an amazing presentation. Um, Yes, thank you for your contact information there. Uh, yep. First of all, I ask, did anybody attending have any questions first before I start asking a few myself? <laughs> um, do you have any idea, Josh, on how Tulane intends to evaluate the interventions? Yeah, so um, for instance, we are, uh, a lot of it is, is um, a lot of it is not empirical, right? Like a lot of this is soft. Stuff. It's not like you can say, um, uh, you know, it's not like it's like, oh, you can measure the number of people who get shot. You cannot measure, you know, uh, how someone's emotional health, uh, you know, it impacted something. It's just a lot fuzzier. And so the way we're doing it is through surveys. And so uh, Tulane, for instance, for our Jumpstart program, the program that is offering job opportunities for young people between 16 and 24, We've got a series of surveys that young people are, are, they took at the beginning of the program and that they're also going to take at the end. And um, then we're looking to, you know, follow our participants to see whether there was a long-term impact. I mean, certain things that we can calculate, like did the young person end up sticking and staying with an employer after their nine month um, internship? You know, did the young person end up being employed two years later? So, you know, it's a mix of soft and, and hard um, things, but uh, for the sort of emotional components, a lot of that is going to be surveys. And then, you know, only time will tell um, how it all bears out. So would that be, would that be, a, I mean, primarily public health staff and students and, you know, graduates in that experience measuring those or you know how do you think they would staff their study groups yeah i mean it, it is uh the school of public health and so you know we've been working with uh kat Dial and julia fleckman you know they've got uh, fellows in excuse me uh, in that school who actually have a focus on gun violence prevention and so you know part of the thinking here is we as government cannot, we are not best positioned to be doing academic research, right? So we need to be partnering with the people who are. And so, you know, they have been dying to want to partner. As a matter of fact, they use a lot of city data because uh, their, their work centers on healthy communities. And so this is just the continuation of the partnership that's already been built. And, you know, we want them to be studying things that we as the city can immediately turn around and use to get better so that we can start to show improvements over time in these problems. Yeah, I mean, um, so are you kicking off using city funds? Was this part of the last budget process or this, the standing up of this office or is this new initiative or are you look i mean are we looking for recurring budget allocations for this department year over year 
Um, I mean, I know you're, you know, you're talking about seeking funding, but what, 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 what is jumpstarting your office right now? Yeah. So, um, as of this moment, we have not taken on an extra dollar in, um, in general fund dollars, right? Mm -hmm. So what we've done is we've actually just concentrated a lot of stuff that was happening already mm -hmm. underneath. But moving forward, we are going to be asking for general fund dollars. Because, you know, the city needs to be making a regular recurring investment in this so that over time we can get better. With that said, we've also raised outside capital. So, um, you know, the Kellogg Foundation is supporting the office with a two-year grant for $400,000. Um, the Hilton Foundation is supporting that Jumpstart initiative for two years, the Workforce Development Program, with, at two hundred fifty grand. So we've been able to raise outside dollars to be able to um, – you know, enact and, and jumpstart this, but, um, but eventually, you know, the city needs to have skin in the game. And then what I'm hoping is that, you know, through finding these alternative sources of funding, you know, what I would love is for this office to be able to actually dole out money. I would love for us not to be able to, not to have to actually rely on general fund dollars because we have done such a good job of connecting young people who are at risk um, with, Medicaid insurance folks who stand to financially lose, and we can figure out how to reverse those incentives so that it's profitable for an insurance company to invest on the front end versus um, not and uh, dealing with the cost of someone getting shot on the back end. And those just aren't the cost um, to them, but they're also the cost to all of us. Oops. Any additional questions or? Has Ms. there Dunbar, been any contact you? with Medicaid people? I'm sorry, what? Has there been any contact with Medicaid people to even throw out this idea to them? Yeah, no, I'm talking with three at the moment. Well, I'm talking with two. Uh, and there are other folks who are, um, who are interested in alternative forms of financing. And so, yeah, I mean, the thing is, this is such a new approach. Right, out based financing. Um, it, it's new, but I, there are. I think they see the vision, right? It's not hard to put the study in front of them that we had done. This is twenty five point seven million dollars that could have been profit for them, um, and more importantly, it could be life saving for our people. And so, I think there's a natural synergy. Um, you know, I, I, I'm excited about one of the partnerships in particular, but hopefully, uh, you know, we'll be able to announce that. That, that's pretty soon. Thank you. I just have one question, um, if I may. I heard you mention um, going into high schools and kind of working um, with them on the, I guess, social emotional learning piece. Um, are are y'all thinking about going any younger than that to middle schools or even elementary? Um, well, so because the, there are young people shooting each other right now in high school, like that's where we want to be. Um, I mean, I think eventually that's something worth considering. Uh, but, you know, I think the piece that we are really looking to nail is how do we do it sustainably? Um, you know, showing up once every couple months isn't, isn't how you get all the information you need to, to, to act in a preventative way. And so we've, while we're meeting with um, folks from, from schools um, and trying to figure that out, one of the things we've been thinking about is what does it look like to actually empower young people through some sort of fellowship so that in some ways they are, are acting on our behalf. They are actually the, the violence interrupters in school because, you know, even though teachers are going to know about this stuff because they're going to hear about it in schools, young people are going to know about it way before even the teachers do. And so, um, you know, those are some of the things that we've been we've been throwing around um, and, and we've been working towards going into elementary schools isn't yet something that we've um, or, or middle schools isn't yet something that that we've considered just because the need is so great right now in high school. Um, but but hopefully I think, as we scale. I think and the um, I think the the impetus for the question was that it's it's learned behavior over the course of a, a person's life. And if we teach them skills at a younger age and how to interact and resolve conflicts when they're younger, then it doesn't become the issue when they get to high school. And so I guess just 
as somebody who's been an educator for like 20 years, I'm, um, I'm trying to express that I, I do think that younger people probably need that support too. So maybe just put it in the back of your head somewhere. No, that's really helpful, Jennifer. I appreciate that. All right, let's call for any questions, comments. Um, next steps with the initiative in your office. Uh, what do you think your next milestones are uh, with standing up some of these programs? I mean, I know some may have already been implemented, but uh, is there anything that's still waiting or um, waiting to be started or? No, I mean, everything that I've mentioned is happening. Um, mm -hmm. The four interventions are, are going um, and, you know, we are waiting for the, the, the scheduling time to be able to do rollouts of the two lane piece and, and of the funding um, stuff. But, but yeah, all that stuff is happening. And so, I mean, the, the goal is how do we keep moving and how do we keep building? Mm -hmm. well, fantastic. Yeah, so to answer, to, to answer Matthew's uh, question, yes. We have. So the mayor signed on to um, a bill or excuse me, a letter um, op opposing that that ban uh, that bill. Chief Ferguson also spoke out against it. Um, you know, we we understand that, uh, you know, unfortunately, in Louisiana, the, the city is exempted and preempted from making legislation around gun control measures. But uh, we really, really hope that the state of Louisiana doesn't allow permitless uh, concealed carry. I think it's just gonna make everything, it's gonna make things worse. And so, um, yes, we've opposed it vocally. I, I suppose, uh, sorry, uh, um, uh, Mr. Cox, the, other than vocal opposition is there. So there are some grassroots op, uh, operations and organizations working and letter writing and spamming, not necessarily, but just making sure we're heard. Are there more uh, working with organizations other than just publishing, um, you know, a single letter or something like that? Um, are there partnerships being built? And uh, I suppose is there more being done than just publishing a, a vocal opposition? Well, I mean, we're using our legislative apparatus to try to defeat it, um, which I think is 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 pretty helpful. Um, I mean, you know, I, we're in a state where uh, our delegation of seventeen is outnumbered, um, but we're doing everything that we can to to to, to make sure the bill doesn't pass. Um, if you've got other suggestions for ways that we can get involved, I'd, I'd love to hear them. I mean, I mean that seriously, like I really would like to, to help if possible. Um, so if you've got ideas, please feel free to, to reach out. My email is, um, I'll put it in the chat for you. I will. It's social media oriented. Perhaps some people have heard of it, but, uh, yeah, it's anyway. Thank you. Yep. All right. Last call for any comments or input thank you guys so much for for giving me this opportunity i really appreciate it yeah really appreciate the updates and and the information the programs that are going on thank you hopefully i see y'all around the bayou <laughs> yeah probably so all right um yeah, uh, not too much uh, that was scheduled as far as presentation or agenda this evening. So I wanted to kind of go over some outstanding, oh, sorry, before I do that, uh, look for your emails if you're not already on our email list. Uh, oh goodness, now that I say that, I don't know where the email list is. If you are a member, you should already have joined. It should already be disseminating, but also all of our notices and things are also posted to the news section on mcnote.org. Uh, if you've been here for the last few meetings, you may have noticed uh, representatives from St. Margaret's that have presented about the status of the Lindy Boggs uh, site and their property that they manage there. And then also a request for by WWL Television to do some press this week about some of the chronicling of outstanding blight 
uh, conditions uh, and projects in the city. So as a board, we're trying to move forward to shine more light on this issue and this outstanding condition. Uh, we've crafted a letter that will be published and sent out to news outlets and and our elected officials through Mid City for more attention to be focused on this. Um, I know there's been work in progress, but the lack of noticeable work at the site currently and the continued drain on resources uh, and kind of the continued um, delayed promises of of just basic maintenance uh, have kind of gone unheard. So um, look for that coming soon, probably this evening or first thing Monday morning uh, for a copy to be posted on mcno.org. Um, also want to take this time to go over uh, some land use applications and uh, refresh everybody on process of some of these things. Uh, you know, there was a backlog of applications because of COVID and um, you could see that with kind of uh, a lot coming through all at once, you know, uh, MC knows mid cities a really large neighborhood. So there's lots of different projects that could be proposed from, you know, residential to different types of commercial um, and just going by order received, um, First of all, I want to make sure that you you know how to make your public comment hurt. So right now, until um, only one of these has been assigned a zoning docket number, so it's already been heard once by zoning. But for all the rest, uh, right now, I'll give you reference numbers and addresses. But if you look in the chat, the um, to submit your comment to be considered by either the C CPC or BZA, it's cpcinfo at nola.gov. And also there's a phone in option for anyone who needs assistance. Um, I know a lot of the meetings are virtual. I know they're in the process of transitioning to a hybrid meeting um, to allow in-person as well as remote. And that number is 504-658-7033. So if you know anybody who may be adjacent to these properties, these applications and want to want don't have computer access or isn't able to attend meetings, um, there should be someone to assist you from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. to take public comment. So, uh, so talking about some of the pending applications now is uh, 2701 Tulane Avenue. Um, I'm putting the information there. This one is has been to, uh, I believe, BZA and is in design review committee. Um, they've had at least one hearing on design review and a lot of feedback coming going back and forth. This is a conditional use to permit a convenience store to a gas station and uh, and does not require a zoning change. It's just a conditional review process. They did hold an MPP prior. Uh, we did publish that and promote. Uh, personally, I, I don't believe I was able to attend. I believe it was remote. Um, but if anyway, if you had uh, feedback you wanted to provide on this. Um, also, the City Planning Commission meetings are all on YouTube as well. So you can actually view the history of these design meetings that they had on this application per se, um, and see kind of the process of that. Um, speaking of process, uh, I wanted to point out a couple of resources that CPC has to kind of dictate their information um, that I wasn't even aware of because I always have questions. It's a very convoluted process. There's a flowchart that kind of details, I think is up to date, uh, that details applications and the entire flow of what an applicant has to go through and what triggers public input response. So that can be reviewed at that PDF link that I point, uh, shared below. And then also to stay up to date on these items, you can always subscribe to hearing notices and for um, other NPP notices by signing up for noticeme.nola.gov and also subscribing to the CPC commission agendas. Um, I try to read them. Sometimes they can be really long, um, you know, 
when we get these notices for NPP, it doesn't always include some of the project numbers and reference numbers that are easy to search for. And so sometimes the email subscriptions coming through has to be very kind of tedious as far as reviewing the uh, individual projects by address uh, and when those meeting times would be. But um, let's see. Uh, and then, so uh, uh, most of these are accepting public comment in all different ways, especially before there's ever a hearing. If you send your input via that phone number or email, it gets collated into the staff reports. So it's included. It may not be necessarily read aloud at the meetings, but it is provided in a condensed report to uh, either the CPC or BZA, depending on what board they need to go in front of for approval. Now, you also have the opportunity to comment either coming soon in person, but also during the meeting as well. Uh, by going to those agenda items and submitting through the form there, which should be read aloud during those meetings. So um, there's more than one way to make yourself heard. Uh, I think, you know, this, since we can't be there in person, although soon will be, I believe, a pretty diminished capacity of like 20% or 25%, um, still, you, there are outlets to have uh, your input heard. Uh, going down the... Uh, order we receive these, uh, there's also an application for 217 South Rendon. Uh, this is a planned development of the old gymnasium, I believe of uh, this, the school at Canal Street. Um, I've tried to detail this with a lot of interested neighbors. I, you can see through their application on one stop, a lot of the feedback that they're getting by searching either that project number and uh, that's what I'm talking about with the notes as it's being condensed into the into the staff reports that are presented. Um, I've also we've all this is uh, not a redundant. This is a um, what should I say a zombie application. Uh, this was brought up in I believe 2016. Uh, this same project with very few changes to this application except for a slight density increase or the mention of affordable units. Uh, I really highly suggest going and seeing the bottom two links that we posted in this MPP notice um, and reading this final staff report from 2016 uh, to give you a better idea of the history of this application and this uh, site for the past you know, six years. Um, the next one is the conditional use application for the Step back for drive through restaurant, the future Chick fil A site. Um, that MPP was held oh, about two weeks ago on the 26th. Uh, and um, these are the reference numbers and project codes to submit to reference this application for public comment. Um, you know, we're still looking, f uh, I think there's definitely a lot of. Uh, positions people want to make on this application. Um, I will remind everybody that this is a functioning drive through restaurant as is and could open without this being approved uh, tomorrow. So I think what they're trying to do with this application is provide for the most amount of vehicular use and queuing as possible to alleviate the traffic concerns. Now, it was mentioned, and I believe it is required both by the state and CPC for a traffic impact study. Um, I'm hoping that's made public. Um, I don't know the different processes or if it's required to be made public, um, but hopefully it, it can be seen by the community uh, at least before this, this vote is made and other concessions can possibly be requested for it. But this is the time to submit your public comment for specific requests about either signage um, you know, easements, uh, operations, uh, opening in of entry and exits to the property. Um, you know, all of that would have to be taken into account definitely with a approval of that. But like I said, could function as is with the existing structure and the curb cuts uh, as they exist today. So... Um, the next one that came up, I believe, last week um, 
this is a group of uh, residential properties uh, that are now vacant that are being requested to be turned uh, for a zoning change for parking to uh, provide parking for surrounding businesses like piece of meat by your beer garden and by your wine garden. Um, like I said, these, except for the first one I mentioned, this does not have a zoning or hearing date yet, but still uh, public comment is open. You can submit using these reference numbers. Uh, I invite anybody to, to revisit, you know, those sites in particular and uh, see what's the, the best greater good in your opinion for the shape of the neighborhood. Um, now, I, I have some upcoming notices for MPP meetings for other projects and other applications. Um, this is 2900 Perdido Street, uh, which is the proposed uh, Medical Justice Center services building. Uh, I believe what's triggering this application is also uh, um, a setback issue um, because of, I believe it's utility lines that are feeding to this site um, because this is, would be placed in between two other facilities. And because of those utility lines, they have to be positioned in a certain way based on these this application um, on, that, on that parcel. And I, I know there's still pending litigation as far as uh, decision or, or another level of appeal that may be in the process. Um, to decide how funding or whether it will be funded or whether it be, is being required to be funded. And so this is showing that some of this work is already being put under contract by architects and developers, and they're required to hold this public meeting on, I believe this one's going to be remote as well. I can post that information here. This is on Thursday. Looks like they're having two, Thursday, May 20th, and June 17th. Um, and the links and phone number access are in the notes here. They're also in the first link I pro provided on mcnote.org. And then also uh, a notice that came in today. Um, this is the first MPP uh, notice I've seen that's going to be in person. So 600 North Broad is requesting a zoning change from HMU to MU1, um, which would then require them to seek a conditional use for outdoor amusement for an outdoor uh, bar, restaurant with live entertainment. Um, this is the Broadside. Uh, Broadside is kind of operating under a temporary measure right now uh, and temporary uh, you know, approvals. And this would be for, um, if approved, this would allow them to develop something permanent uh, in that location. Uh, I will have some of their details. Their, um, their letter was just sent to me this afternoon and uh, their plans and some of their high level uh, visuals are attached to that. So I'll have that on mcno.org, uh, hopefully tonight or tomorrow morning, so. And then also reminders, um, that meeting in person, 600 North Broad on Monday, May 17th at 4 p.m. So um, I haven't looked up a reference number quite yet on this item as I just received it. So uh, I know that was a pretty big rundown, but there's a lot going on in Mid-City. Uh, there's obviously a lot of, you know, potential shovels to ground here. Um, and this is the time now to make your voice heard. Uh, you know, the the most constructive criticism is is the ones that have uh, merit based on the secret nine criteria. Sorry, not secret, public but tedious nine criteria of uh, land use that I can share with you. Sorry, I had the zoning link open. Hold on, just a minute. Uh, Yes, here we go. These are the nine criteria for approval standards. Um, and nearly every 
applications that's seeking either a zoning change or variance or conditional use, uh, not necessarily conditional use, have to meet these conditions to be approved and typically all nine unless there are special circumstances. So uh, special conditions and circumstances exist are uh, peculiar to the land or structure involved with the application. Uh, literal interpretation of the provisions of this ordinance would deprive the applicants of rights of commonly enjoyed by other properties in the same district. Number three, special conditions and circumstances do not result from the actions of the applicant. Number four, granting the variance request would not confer on the applicant any special privilege which is denied by this ordinance to other lands or structures in the same district. Number five, if granted, will not alter the essential character of the locality. Number six, strict adherence to the regulation by the property will result in demonstrable hardship. Number seven, the request for the variance is not based primarily upon a desire to serve the convenience or profit of the property owner or the other interested parties. Number eight, the granting of the variance will not be determined to the public wealth, will not be detrimental to the public welfare or in, uh, injurious to the property or improvements in the neighborhood in which the property is located. And number nine, the proposed variance will not impair an adequate supply of light and air to adjacent property, increase, substantial, uh, increase substantially the congestion in the public street, increase the danger of fire, or endanger the public safety. So every applicant and every uh, special condition is evaluated on those nine criteria. And if you ask me as just an amateur at land use, if you can give your public feedback with reference or with either support or arguments against any of those nine criteria for uh, an applied for applicant, uh, I think that's probably the most effective and uh, will, will make your case for the most effective public comment on a project, whether for or against. So just wanted to put that out there. We've had a lot of applications in the past month and a half. Uh, I've attended uh, most of these MPP meetings myself. Um, and I know we've gotten some input, but not a whole lot, but I wanna just reiterate, this is the way to uh, make your effective public comment. So any questions or anything, Claire, that, that you can add or clarify on what I already touched on? No, that was perfect. Good job. Great. Um, and we're still reconsidering, um, you know, our organization, uh, the organization stance and, um, and method of taking positions on individual land use items, but I feel like um, the more the merrier, the more diverse and quantity of comment and input, uh, probably the best to actually formulate a decision on this. Uh, I think, you know, it's, it's tough to constantly steward over these applications as just one small body of board members and volunteers and to try and publish this um, uh, in, in a more accessible way and make sure that, uh... so uh, a lot of these links are available either through the, the city's website. We have, I have been crafting a resource page, uh, hopefully detailing some of this information. If you're looking for uh, me to compile this, um, all these comments and these links will be included with the uh, the recording of the video that we'll be posting on YouTube and uh, mcno.org. So. All right, well, um, let's see. The other thing I wanted to ask for, him, oh, Fred, go ahead. I was just saying that was helpful, thank you. Oh, sure. Uh, I'm, we're looking for input on, uh, our next meeting and our future meetings, uh, looking of ways to safely meet in person. Uh, I've reached out to one location. Uh, Thurgood Marshall has the covered basketball court on their campus uh, with power and lighting, which I think would provide us with enough space and to distance while also keeping us safe from hopefully the heat uh, <laughs> and rain. Um, but I realize that our next meeting is June 
So um, if you have any other ideas, uh, uh, please contact me uh, or the board. Uh, I can be reached at this email address, president at mcno.org. Here's my phone number. And here's the way to contact the board at large, info at mcno.org. Um, it's just one of many options we have. I'm kind of looking for, um, you know, places that have electricity uh, in case we do run a little bit longer and it does start to get dark. Um, I know heat's going to be an issue, um, but I know that we can probably start to do this in person, especially outdoors, uh, safely and hopefully re-engage and, and uh, bring our bring a lot of our residents who have kind of been left behind by this digital divide back into the fold by meeting publicly in open air spaces. So um, I believe the next meeting is, sorry, uh, June 14th. Um, and I know we start these at 6 p.m., but uh, I think probably move back to 6.30 once we're in person to allow people to travel and, and commute and, and get to the destination. Um, so um, I think it will, no matter where it is, it's probably going to be a BYO chair. Um, we'll definitely have tables. We'll definitely have, uh, you know, a PA system. Um, I don't know if we're going to be sharing microphones. I haven't thought that far ahead or how to safely do that. I'm looking for some guidance and input from the community and, and what uh, you all may want. So, um, but that's, can I, sure. Can I, the, um, I always notice near the farmer's market on the greenway, the, the way station looks like it's set up. Um, it's always closed and locked. It seems like a possible ideal space. Is that mm. ever possible to, to use? Who controls that space? Yeah, I mean, that's controlled by the Greenway, but that's, um, yeah, that's a great location now that you're saying it. I'm, I'm definitely looking for something that's covered just in case. I, I'd hate to have to do a lot of setup and then have to cancel because of rain or something. So um, that would be ideal. But yeah, that's a really great location. I mean, we I'm, talked I'm referring to the to the covered area. It's, it's yeah. just caged, though, but in, yeah. Um... That should work perfectly. I think, yeah, because somebody had mentioned the plaza, and I think the plaza is a great idea. But like you said, the, the actual covered space behind that would be even better, and I didn't even think of that. Um, so thank you for that suggestion. That's huge. Um, I have not seen that used by anyone except for during uh, Lumina celebration over the Greenway, but hopefully it might be an option. Awesome. All right. Um, Open it to the floor. Any other items people wanted to bring up or suggestions for our June meeting? Um, other things we need to present or discuss uh, going forward? Um, we try to focus at least one of our early summer meetings on storm preparedness. Um, that didn't happen in May, so we may be looking to June to do uh, some of our information from Nola Ready and other community partners about our storm preparedness procedures. Um, but any other interested parties want to present or or bring up a topic of discussion, please please let us know. And uh, for future scheduling, uh, I haven't discussed this with the board, but personally, I'll be out of town for July. A lot of times we take off a July meeting. Um, typically, you know, we meet the second Monday of each month. That usually falls right around when the July 4th holiday is happening. Also, our, our former meeting space of Warren Easton closes their campuses for the entire month of July. So it's been kind of our, our way of uh, just giving everybody a little community break from our regular schedule for the month of July. So, um, you know, we may not be meeting July, but we'll pick back up in August. Sounds good. All right, great. Well, uh, Stephen, you have any comments or uh, anything else you wanted to share? Just thanks for having me and thanks for having Josh, the, the Bears Director of Strategic Initiatives. Uh, just briefly, uh, our, our public libraries, including Mid-City, on May 17th will expand to non-appointment visitors. I think that's important. Um, be on the lookout for uh, young people in your sphere who want to participate in the Junior Civic Leadership Academy over the summer. Uh, it will be our third 
uh, version of that. And it's an excellent program for, for teenagers. I uh, spent some time on a Saturday morning learning about uh, uh, city government. It's the youth version of the adult uh, Civic Leadership Academy. I encourage any anyone who hasn't participated in that to, to apply for that in the next uh, version of that. Uh, we'll have our um, neighborhood engagement uh, quarterly meeting on June 12th, and the and the theme and, and the topic will be emergency preparedness. So Dr. Abegno and the director of OSEP will be the main speakers there. So just be on the lookout. Um, Y'all do an excellent job of of kind of moving forward information that comes from the city, particularly our office uh, of neighborhood engagement, which is important because really one of our main missions is to connect citizens to city government and city government to citizens. Um, and and to to you know provide information and to build your capacity to be informed citizens um, and all of that. So um, that's about it. Uh, COVID vaccinations continue to um, you know inch up in percentage. Uh, I just finally want to encourage everyone to think of ways um, that that uh, the city can can reach folks who are more hesitant. Uh, for whatever reason, if you have creative ideas in your networks, in your spheres, in your professional life, uh, in your friendships, um, please feel free to reach out to me uh, or the Neighborhood Engagement Office in general. Provide those ideas and we'll we'll percolate those up. Um, we're looking for ideas and, and y'all are smart folks and, um, and, and can certainly provide that. So that's all I had. Chris, I appreciate the time, man. Hey, thank you so much, Stephen. All right, well. That being said, I'm going to motion to adjourn this meeting. Thank you, everybody, for showing up. Uh, I know I limped through with a lot of uh, missed sleep last night. I'm not feeling too energetic. And I know this land use stuff can get really bogged down and tedious. So uh, thanks for sticking with me. And uh, see you at the next one, if not sooner. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thank you.